Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to Abundant Life. It's Wednesday night. We're going to have a good time in the Lord tonight. Let's stand up and greet somebody close by. Tell them how good it is to see them here tonight. Hallelujah. Didn't we have a time in here this weekend? Hallelujah. Had a good time in the Lord. Every service, every service can be the same. It doesn't have to be all the same running, the same shouting, but every service we ought to come in here expecting a move of God, somebody to leave healed, somebody to leave filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got some prayer requests we're going to take care of right off the bat. Tonight, if you'll stand all over the house, Sister Judy Whiteman is in need of prayer tonight. She is sick. She wants also, she wants prayer uh, for one of her eyes. It says the cataract transplant is rejecting, and they aren't sure if they'll be able to have another one, and it could lead to blindness in that eye, and she's asking for God to take care of that. We know a God that can do more than just heal an eye. Amen. Hallelujah. Brother Scobie's in need of prayer tonight. Sister Hawkins, Sister Hensley is in need of prayer tonight. Let's also remember Brother Klein. It was so good to see him here Sunday night. And uh, we've got, we've got several, several people that we need to touch God for. Brother Larry Price, uh, I haven't heard any updates on him or how he's doing. Let's continue to pray for him. Continue to, yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's good to hear. Let's continue to pray for them. He'll get strength and uh, pray for the family. I know they had some, some traveling to do back and forth to Nashville. So let's pray for them tonight. Let's all lift our hands across this sanctuary. Let's ask God to come into this place and heal. Lord, we love you so much. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we give him a hand clap of praise and just thank him for a minute? Just thank him for what he's done. Thank him for the miracles we're going to hear about, the healings we're going to hear about. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn around and ask somebody if they came to give the Lord their best tonight. Hallelujah. Worship with us as we sing. You may be seated.
this evening's offering. Before we do, we're going to invoke the spirit of Goshen. Before we do that, let me make one, I apologize, one quick announcement. I had it in my prayer requests. For the Morgan Coffee, would like to meet with all the young people tonight, immediately following service, right over here in the men's prayer room. So if you're a young person, please be over there immediately following service. This weekend is a back to school service this coming Sunday night. And we're going to be praying over our kids. Some of them have already started school. We're going to be praying over our kids and uh, anointing them that they can go back and have a successful school year and that God will keep his hand on them all the way through. Amen. Amen. Look at somebody in the eye and tell them you're going to get a raise on your job, a bonus check, or an unexpected blessing. Tell them the blessings of the Lord are upon you. For I bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. Now let's lift our hands, let's lift our offering, let's lift our voices, let's begin to invoke the spirit of Goshen in this place. for it, Jesus. Thank you for it, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As the ushers come wait on us, you may be seated. Worship with us as we sing.
just how to live beyond ourselves. Let everything we say and do bring glory to your name and bless your Every day, every day, 
I can't walk without you holding my hand, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to dismiss Children's Church this evening, 4 through 11 years of age. They will go quickly and quietly. To turn this service to our pastor. The rest of us in this room right now, what if we couldn't stand and just begin to give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Begin to give God the best that we've got as the pastor comes and takes his pulpit. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Had somebody text me, I believe it was Monday, he said that knot had fallen off of their body and where they was having problems feeling something they felt in that place again had another person tell me they were instantly pain free Sunday night amen amen well the Kleindens spoke a word into my life on Monday morning uh, and I feel like that it was reaffirmed throughout the week We've got to learn to celebrate what God is doing while He's doing it. Don't always try to look for the next big thing just to learn to realize the things God is doing right now is the most important thing in the world. And uh, I'm thankful for what all God has done. Amen. The last few months, uh, we've had miracles, we've had signs, and we've had wonders. Supernatural demonstrations that are unexplainable. We've had healings. We've had people pray back through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We've had deliverance from addictions. Hallelujah. Thank God for what He's doing in this place. And what He's going to continue to do in this place. Thank God for Sarah praying Sunday night. Mike's daughter, amen. We're going to continue to pray for her, that God will continue to help her, bring her back to the fullness of what she needs to be. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm going to try to be mindful of the time. I text Brother Jordan Morrell that's back there and asked him to put a 20-minute timer up. He still hasn't done it. So either he hasn't gotten my text or uh, he's in blatant rebellion. So we're going to just assume he hadn't gotten my text. Amen. Put a 20-minute timer up. I'm going to be mindful of the time, all these kids going back to school, and uh, those that are already started, try to mind that mindset and not hold you long tonight. The Lord spoke to me something in prayer Monday night for this church for tonight. Amen. Re Revelations chapter 2, verse 13. Amen. As well as 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8 like to turn your attention to both of those places, Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, and 1 Samuel 30 and 8, amen, amen, hallelujah, if your kids have went back to school and they're grouchy, clap your hands, all right, thank you, I knew there was somebody out there who was appreciative of the timer, amen, I know thy works, where thou dwellest. Even where Satan's seat is, somebody say the devil has a seat. Amen. He has a seat. Now hold us fast, my name is not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Satan lives, and Satan has a seat where this church is trying to have revival. I want the church here at Abundant Life to know that you can have revival even if the devil's fighting. Amen. Amen. Read 1 Samuel chapter 30 verse number 8. 1 Samuel chapter 30 verse number 8. I'm going to try to be quick. Amen in my message. And uh, David inquired at the Lord saying, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. Now we have changed our midweek service to being just as evangelistic as our Sunday night.
and we went to Bible study on Sunday morning and teaching. So tonight, I don't want you to settle in, but I want to talk to you and preach to you on restoring zigzag. Restoring zigzag. Amen. Jesus, we love you and we thank you and we praise you that you always hear us. I know you spoke to me Monday night, God, in prayer meeting, speaking to me about this, this service specifically. God, I thank you for everything you did this weekend, the miraculous and the marvelous things that you poured out on your people. We appreciate what you've done, showing us that you care about your people, Lord. I'm asking you to continue to work works in our midst right now. Show yourself mighty in this place tonight. We pray and we thank you for it. Somebody shout amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Uh, The story of Ziglag does not start with David in 1 Samuel 30, but it starts with David running scared for his life from an ever-present issue. In fact, David was quoted to say something like this, I shall surely fall one day by the hand of Saul. His mood as he began to run for his life was a place where he feared fear itself. He was scared to death. He was running scared for his life from this man that wanted to kill him. He was pushed from the comfort of his friends and from the marriage of his royal wife and to the power of his blessing and his divine destiny. But David didn't see it that way. David seen it like he was running for his life and he was scared to death and he felt like God had dejected him somehow. I'm going to tell you, sometimes God has to remove us from the table of comfort to get us to the place where he can connect us to his divine will. Well, sometimes we have been so comfortable for so long that the Lord literally has to push us out of our comfort zone. In fact, I'll tell you that Acts chapter 2 is powerful. But the most powerful thing is when Acts chapter amen, 8 and 9 and 10 begin to take place and they begin to be pushed out of Jerusalem. And the reason it was powerful was because it was the will of God. However, the church probably thought it was not the will of God because they were being persecuted but the only way that God could get the church out of Jerusalem into the uttermost part of the earth is to make them uncomfortable I get scared when we have Wednesday nights where people are comfortable. I get scared when we have Sunday mornings where people are, I'm not talking about our visitors, I'm talking about our saints, uh, are comfortable. We're just satisfied uh, with status quo. Uh, God, wake us up in this hour that we would become uncomfortable with staying in a Jerusalem mindset. I'm going to tell you, Joseph would have been trapped into the thinking that his mom and dad and his brothers was all he was ever going to rule over if God would not have pushed him out of his comfort zone and made him go to Egypt. David is literally pushed from the comfort of his life into running for his life. And he ended up in a very familiar place. He ended up in a place called Gath. He had faced a guy by the name of Goliath one time from that very place he ends up in Goliath's hometown and when he gets there the Bible says that the servants of Achish said unto him is not this David the king of the land isn't it amazing that the devil knows more about us uh, than we know about ourselves Is it not amazing to you that whenever Peter is getting ready to go into Pentecost, uh, Jesus said, I have prayed for you that thy faith fail not. Why? Because Satan had desired to sift him as wheat. Because Satan remembered things about Peter that Peter forgot about himself. I've told it to you time and time again. But the Bible says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. If God ever gave you a gift, uh, he's not going to sit there and become the Indian give her now if he's ever called you it's time to step into that calling Uh, I don't care how bad uh, or how messed up your life is right now it could be God pushing you into the moment of your destiny I wish I could get some help up in this house Uh, amen they literally said did not they sing about this guy didn't they sing that David had slayed his thousands and saw or excuse me saw his thousands and David uh, his tens of thousands and 1 Samuel 21 said David laid up these words in his heart but he didn't get more power from them he got more afraid of them 
Satan was striking fear in his heart using the enemy and Achish the king of Gath and the Bible said that when uh, that happened I know I've told you about this before but just bear with me because the Lord spoke to me to preach all about Ziglag right here when that happened the Bible said that Achish the king of Gath brings him before him uh, and when they do uh, he changed his behavior before them uh, and feigned himself mad in their hands Uh, that word there literally means uh, praise Uh, if you look that up in the Hebrew, uh, amen, it's Tehillah. And it literally means that he began to praise God uh, until they thought he had went crazy. And he scrabbled on the doors of the gate uh, and spit started falling down upon his beard. Uh, I've come to tell every person in this building, uh, I want to be seeker friendly. Uh, I want people to come in here and I want them to feel at home. Uh, I want visitors to feel like they belong. Uh, but I don't want to ever lose the dynamic demonstration of praise that comes with the apostolic Pentecostal message I want to have that in my spirit that whenever the Holy Ghost begins to move me I'm not worried about who's looking at me I'm not worried about what people think about me but I get up out of my pew and I begin to dance before Jesus Christ he is worthy of all I've been I've not went anywhere like Brother Kleindance, but I've been twice, amen, by myself overseas, three times total on mission trips, twice just by myself. And once it was to St. Lucia. St. Lucia has this whole mindset where they praise God like wild men. Amen. Those of you that went to Barbados knows that I'm telling you the truth because they just praise God with all their heart and their mind, their soul, their strength. Uh, and, and, and they get a hold of, uh, of each other and literally they begin to lift their legs up uh, so high it looks like they're high stepping uh, as they praise God in a circle. The women and men in Brazil, they begin to praise God a little different when they worship the Lord. They do it more ceremoniously. They have a lot more uh, ceremonies to it. Brother Thompson and and even Brother Alviar, they have a lot more ceremonial things. They have a lot of singing and people who come up. But one thing I notice when the Holy Ghost begins to hit, um, they might be playing a a song where you can, it's not even a soundtrack. You can hear the singer singing uh, and they're singing over top of the singer. But when the Holy Ghost begins to hit them, they begin to shout and they begin to dance and they begin to praise God. There's something about it no matter what culture you're in, no matter whether it's ceremony, or it's out of control no matter what happens I I believe uh, that the apostolic Pentecostal church uh, needs a revitalization uh, of the tabernacle of David uh, in this hour we need to praise God uh, like we've never praised God before Uh, we don't need to get it dumbed down Uh, we need it to become more uh, amen wild uh, and more violent than it's I know it has a place I know you don't want to scare visitors, but there's something about true praise and worship that's not fake. Listen, if you're in a snake handling church and they break out the snakes and start dancing with them, it doesn't take an Einstein to know that that's not Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. If you're, in a, if you're in a church that doesn't have a bit of spirit in it, but yet somehow they're still dancing to the beat of the music, it doesn't take an Einstein to know that that ain't Jesus Christ. I don't know why we've gotten to the 2010 era and suddenly we think our visitors are stupid. But they can't tell what's real and what's fake. You and I told what's real and what's fake. Now, it scared the fire out of you probably, right, Phil? You come to church, people going crazy, and you're like, my goodness, these people lost their mind. But you didn't go out of there thinking, I think they fake that tonight. No, that did not cross my mind. Not one time. I don't think it's ever been. I don't think I've ever heard a visitor say, you know what? I think that was fake. When they leave here, they might be scared, but they got to know that it's real. And when David began to praise God, he didn't care what they thought of him. He needed an answer from Jehovah. He was standing in the middle of an enemy's camp in front of an enemy king where Satan's seat was, and he needed an answer. I'm telling you, we need a revitalization of the spirit of David in our spirit right now. Now that says you know what the devil might be raining rampant uh, and North Korea might be getting ready to bomb uh, but I'm telling you uh, I feel a shouting uh, coming on uh, I feel a praise uh, in my spirit 
Listen, if we could just praise God in front of our enemies, when we reach our moments of difficulty, it will confuse them. I was telling somebody the other night, I think I've told this to this church before, just bear with me. I, I know not what to preach except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Only can preach about Jeremy and my experience. But when I came here to pastor, I stepped into a realm that I had never been in before. I was fighting a level I never fought before. And all of you that have big dreams listen to your pastor right now if you think that you're fighting devils now don't step to the next level because you're going to fight them worse in the next level and if you can't hardly make it now get the victory now before you step to the next level because I stepped into a spiritual warfare level I'd never been in before and I did not go to this man because we've had a policy when I went and told him I felt my call to preach whether it's right, wrong or indifferent he looked at me and he said I will not teach you anything because people are going to say that I've spoon fed you and that I'm the only reason why you're preaching the way you're preaching I've given you all your thoughts and your messages and I'm not going to show you one thing so everything I got I had to dig out for myself we have that policy so I, I knew I got to find this out here so I began to war in the spirit and the devil I don't know how far I'm going to get in my 20 minute time but the devil would come against my mind and when he would come against my mind I would stand there and I would say I rebuke you in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you right now. And it would get worse. I know it don't for you. You, you, you. you fight and you war and it's all good. But for me, for whatever reason, it would get worse. And the Lord said to me. Now, I'm not talking about right that moment. I'm talking about it go away for a little bit and it come right back. And the Lord said something to me. He said, Satan is not scared. Of fighting with you. He's done that with the church for a long time. I said, well, God, what do I do here? He said, he wants you to do anything but praise and worship me. I know I'm going. You know Pastor Van Lue loves spiritual warfare. I've taught on it. I've preached on it. I believe in it. But he said, he don't want you to praise and worship me. And so I learned that when the enemy came in like a flood, I had to lift up the standard of God because it wasn't my fight. It was God's fight anyway. And I would begin to say, hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I praise your name, Jesus. You're worthy of all the praise, Jesus. You see, the devil knew where my goat was tied. And as long as I kept letting him know where my goat was tied uh, he was releasing that goat uh, to terrorize my mind uh, but when I began to let him know when you come in uh, I'm going to let God come out uh, when I began to let him know that uh, he began to wipe back off uh, and that year of fighting turned into a day uh, of victory uh, because I learned uh, that if you want to confuse your enemy uh, just begin to praise God uh, when they think you should be going down uh, lift your hands up when they think you lost it lift your hands up when you're shaken from addiction lift up those hands and say I love you Jesus I praise you Jesus I wish you'd do that right now I wish somebody lift up those hands and begin to say hallelujah hallelujah I believe in spiritual warfare. But when you fight the devil, it needs to be on your firm and your territory and your prayer room. When he's coming in like a flood, it's up to the Lord. All right. I got to hurry. The Bible says that David leaves his presence and goes to Adullam and lives in the hold. And then one day... There comes a day where David gets blessed by the king of Gath, by Achish. The Bible says that he gives David a stronghold. Because David said, if I found grace in thine eyes, let him give me a place in front of town in the country. Amen. That I may dwell there. For thy, why, would, why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? And Achish gave him Ziglag that day. 
Therefore, Ziglag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. David has a stronghold in the camp of the enemy because of a praise that he gave a long time ago. So finally, he has a place to rest, a thing he can call normal. But Ziglag was not his destiny. I think that we have to remember and remind ourselves who we are. I'm going to probably say some strong stuff here. Sometimes I need to know how to back off, I think. But but, uh, I'm not trying to be offensive. But David was meant to be the king of Israel. He was anointed for that purpose. He was not supposed to piddle paddle in zigzag. He was supposed to be the king of Israel. Ziglag was not his destiny. I want to say that I love our church. Me, my dad, Sister Larissa, and Chris. We love our church. I'm going to try that one more time. I want to say that I love our church. I love everything about our church. I had some preachers telling me this week, said, Brother Van Lu, there's just not a lot of churches that go after the Spirit of God like Danville does. And so I love our church. I love how we dance. I love how we shout. I love how we worship. I love how we praise God. I love how we flow with the preacher. Brother Kleindienst, amen, was very impressed, I'm sure, even more than he read on. But he told me, he said some things about our church. Not every church goes after, he said. And not every church is so easy to preach in. That's a very high compliment to our church. From a man that goes all over the world. But I want to say without stepping on anybody's toes more than I am mine. I don't want to ever get satisfied with zigzag moments. Because I'm not trying to bunk up with devils. The Revelation Church, he said, I, I, I'm very proud of you. You have had revival even where Satan's seat is. And David had learned that he could fight or he could worship. And he could automatically have a place of rest even in the front of his enemy. But I'm going to tell you, we've got to move from survival mode to revival mode. Uh, I said we've got to move from survival mode to revival mode. But there came a day at Ziglag where they had came in. My time is up. I got to close right here. They came in. I'm going to do six minutes at 8.15. I'll let you go. We won't even been in church for 45 minutes. There came a day at Ziglag that they came in and they stole... The children, the future, the destiny. And they stole his two wives. I don't know about anybody else, but it bothers me how many backsliders there are. It bothers me. Of the cars is probably, I don't say this to brag on him, I'm, it's just reality. He's, he's probably talked to me more about this than anybody. And I have to say that helped me a lot. Most of the time, backsliders are nothing more than a, a spirit of unrepentant. Because they don't want to forgive. And because they don't want to forgive, they don't want to be forgiven. But the problem is, is that I don't know why they'd ever have to get to that place. Well, they can come to me if they want to say they're sorry. Well, that's that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you think your brother has aught against you, to go to him. And and I, I feel like that there's a lot of wounded souls out there. That could be healed with a spirit of love 
from a church. It's not a matter about who's right and who's wrong. That don't even matter, Sister Savannah. In the kingdom of God, if we're going to go about who's right and who's wrong and hold grudges against the wrong, nobody can ever be saved. So I, I don't come to reprimand tonight. I come to help us. And so what we find at Ziglag, the first issue is, is that everybody has been taken from the very place that God had given them that was between the pig pen and their destiny. Between running scared for their life and the throne. And they've been stolen in that transitional moment. Now, in the process, David, or we'll call it the church, loses two things. Two wives. One of his wives means pleasant. And the other one means joy or father of my joy. Prophet of God walks in here on Sunday and he says, The very thing that has been bothering me as a pastor. But it's hard for a pastor to preach this because everybody thinks he's just referencing what he knows. But that lack of joy that's there. <laughs> and so it's stolen in a moment. Some of y'all got your joy back. On Sunday. But joy is taken from us. And pleasant is taken from us. And if you don't think. That pleasant has been taken from us. Just hang out in the vestibule for a few moments. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Somebody sang this song the other day on Facebook, and it brought back a ton of memories. Some of you elders will remember this. We used to sing this stuff in church, young people. We used to. It's, it's, this is the song. We are happy people. Yes, we are. We are happy people. Yes, we are. Been baptized in Jesus' name, spoke in tongues, and the Holy Ghost came. We are happy people, yes, we are. <laughs> Except we're in Kroger, we're not happy there. Except when we're in Walmart, we're not happy there. <laughs> when we eat out to eat and our waitress messes up on our food, we're not happy in any of those places we just mentioned. I'm going to tell you how you know whether we have Ziglag restored. Have you got joy? And are you pleasant? But if that's not bad enough, Brother Foon, I got like one minute. Everybody turns on us. Everybody. And they want to kill us. Because everybody's been taken. You know, nobody can admit that I'm the reason why my kids have left the church. We always got to point our finger at somebody. And so David has two options. Number one, he can go back to feeling sorry for himself and feeling like he's got to run again. Or he can do something else. And the Bible says he does the latter. He encourages himself in the Lord. Now it's bad when you can't get anybody else to help you encourage yourself. And you got to just encourage yourself in the Lord. And here's where we get all of our excuses taken away from us. He does not call on Brother Adams to sing a song. He just starts encouraging himself in the Lord. I wish I had time. I got a lot of notes, no time. But literally, amen, this is a guy that used to, everywhere he went, he used to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me. The problem with David is he had stopped being led by God and he had been led by his emotions for far too long.
God never told him to go team up with all those Israelite enemies. He never told him to go hang out with them. He meant David was running from his life and he was taking whatever came along. And what the first thing he had to recognize and realize is I got to stop going off of my own understanding and I've got to start leaning on his understanding. You see, when you lean on his understanding, the doctor can come in and give you bad news and you can still feel encouraged in the Lord. When you lean on his understanding, you can get a demotion instead of promotion and you still are encouraged in the Lord there's just something about it when God begins to encourage your spirit amen this joy that I have the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away Mm. if you'll stand I don't want to become a liar hallelujah amen before David can get his stuff back from Ziglag though He has to do something else. Now he's on his way to getting his stuff back from Ziglag. But as he goes by this field, there's this Egyptian going all over the place. Mad, insane. He is sick. The Bible says that they found this Egyptian and David Brings him in, gives him bread, he eats, and he made him drink water. And they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him. For he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. Which means he was about to die. You can't go very long without water. David said unto him, "Do you, whom do you belong and where are you from? He said, I'm a young man from Egypt, but I'm a servant to the people who just took your stuff. But he said, they left me because three days ago, I fell sick. God told me to tell somebody before you can get your backslidden kids back, you got to reach for the people the world are throwing away. Now, I'm going to become very transparent because that's how I pastor, right, wrong, or indifferent. I was up here praying on prayer meeting one Monday night, and I was asking God for a million dollars for our church. God, I'd like you to bless our church. Then I felt stupid because that's an open-ended statement, so I said, God, I'd like you to give our church a million dollars. And the Lord said, I've already gave you almost two million dollars. What have you done with it? I don't know how many of you know this, but business here in this community has put into our hands about $1.7 million worth of merchandise to help reach our community. Now, we can't sell it, pay off our debt, and I regret that. That'd be awesome. But they've given it to us to reach the world. And the Lord smote me. And he said, until you are ready to do extra with the millions I'm putting in your hands, I'm not going to give you any else. I talked to Brandon yesterday and he said, Pastor, I'm up against a dilemma. (laughs) What's that? He said, well, the guy that hooked us up with Walmart, he's moved to Kohl's. Walmart's still giving us stuff. But now he wants to know, because Coles has a warehouse right beside Walmart, he wants to know if we'd be willing to take the stuff from Coles. He said, I'm praying about it. I said, what's there to pray about? <laughs> <laughs> take it. Praise the Lord. Goshen. Oh, come on, somebody. God's put more into our spirit. And the question resounds. Now, I'm not putting this on Sister Hallett or Sister Cornwell. Or I'm not putting this on anybody else it on me until God can see that I can handle the Egyptians he places in my hands he's not going to give me back my lost loved ones I'm done 
I'm not done, but I'm going to quit. I'm not even half done, but I'm going to quit. The Lord said he wants to restore Ziglag in this church, but that's not our destiny. But before we can go to the throne, we got to get Ziglag back. We got to reach after our lost loved ones. We got to get them back. This place needs to be packed with people. We need to be trying to figure out where we're going to put people, not what rows we're going to take out. I'm going to just remain nameless, even the place that I'm talking about nameless. But I've went on outreaches before where I, I, I walk up to this person and they stink so bad. I can't hardly take it. And you know what, Brother LaFoon? God looked at me the same way when I came to the altar. The first time I lifted my hands, that stench was so nasty. Because it's full of sin. But he didn't go, oh, can you step back a little bit? No, he grabbed me and pulled me closer. I got to ask myself, what a three-day-old Egyptian that's been sick. This is not a time where portalits are outside. This is not a time where he could run to the bathroom when he had to throw up. This is a time where anything that happened, it happened right there. And ask myself what that would smell like. I know we don't do that. But I want us to reach for the people that the world's throwing away. Because I feel like, Sister Hustetler, if we do, then we can expect our loved ones back. We can expect Rick in here. We can expect Sarah in here. We can expect Sue in here. We expect it. I want us to lift our hands all over this building. I know the time has passed. I've went way past my time, and I apologize. It's only 823. Will you lift your hands, and will you just ask God, God, I'm asking you to put that. That spiritual restoration back into my life. I know we're not even supposed to be in zigzag. We're not even supposed to be at this spot. We're supposed to go above and beyond. But God, I'm asking you to give us a love again for the lost soul of mankind. The people that the world has dejected and the world has thrown away. God, I'm not talking about the movie stars and the pro athletes and the doctors and the lawyers right now. I'm talking about the people that the Amalekites are pushing into a field and saying they don't want them. I'm talking about the guy that's waking up right now on a three day coke binge that's wondering where he even went to bed at. I'm talking about somebody right now that's waking up in the middle of an alcoholic stupor that don't even know who he was with last night. They don't even know how he got to that bridge. I'm asking you right now God to put a spirit. I can feel people rejecting this prayer God but as for me and a few others in this church I'm asking you to give us a love for the world that we've never had before in our life I'm asking Jeremy Van Lu to get a desire help me to go into a place in you where I can reach for the people that the world is dejecting God God, I believe. I believe my cousins are coming back. I believe Bethany and Jennifer, and I believe the people that nobody ever thought would come back here. I believe they're coming back, God. I believe they're coming back. I believe people that we never thought would come back to the house of God is on their way back as backsliders. I believe Ziglag's going to be restored. Not just what we lost, but more than what we've lost. But God, before we can be given the people that we've lost, the Lord, I believe, wants us to know He has to trust us with the people the world is dejected. Oh, God, help us. Help us to reach like we've never reached.
in our life. In Jesus' name, help Jeremy. Help Jeremy. Ramo korema to die do borama pehesho ye marebo rota damata. Help Jeremy Van Lu. You're blessing our church, Lord. Help us to take those blessings and make them into something. In Jesus' name. Ha. Let's lift our hearts right now again. Let's not reject what God is speaking tonight. Let's not reject what God is speaking tonight. Come on, let's reach for the people hurting and wounded. Jesus. Hallelujah.
Come on, we got to work. Come on, we got to work. We got to work. <laughs> Nobody wants the word work. Nobody likes the word work. But if we're going to see the kingdom of God at hand, if we're going to see people coming back to the kingdom, we got to work. Come on, reach for the people that the world's throwing out. Reach for the people that the world. I'm going to let you go with this story. I've been very careful when I tell this because I don't want anybody upset. I don't want to upset the person for sure, but uh, lately they put out on Facebook what they was and how God had done things for them. But there was a man that came to, whenever me and Brother Weir switched places, he preached here and I preached there a year back or so. He came to that service. I was preaching and the Holy Ghost began to touch him. Listen, he wasn't just a homosexual. He was transgender. He was a cross-dresser, I should say. He had no issue with the fact that he dressed up like a girl. Holy Ghost hit him there. God delivered him that night. Because of an elder that did not accept no for an answer. I started preaching about walking the, aisle, walking the aisles, and this elder started walking the aisles, and he got back to this man, and he said, You know that God wants to touch you tonight. Get up and start walking. <laughs> he got up, started walking in front of that elder, kind of with his head down, and by the time he hit the front of that church, he had his hands and his head up, and God was delivering him right there. Want me to tell you something even better than that? Listen, all of you that, oh, I don't know about that. Well, he's been to Judah. And he's been to your church a few times. And you didn't even know who he was. But something even cooler than that. He has some family members. I'll just leave it at that. He has some family members that wasn't doing exactly what they should be doing. And they had two little kids. And, and, and he was sitting there saying, I don't know if God can do this for me or not. But he said, I really want to help those kids get out of that situation. And so now he's the legal guardian of those two boys. And he's taking them to church every Sunday. I wish I had somebody in this house that understands that while some of us would be trying to reject him because of what he was, God was trying to hold him because of who he was. Oh, God, don't let us push people out when we see that they're different. God, get out of here. Let's reach for the people that the world is throwing away. I'm going to leave you one more thing. I'm going to promise you I'll be done. 834. The Lord spoke to me while we were praying. And he said, if they want miracles, they have to get to the place where they're reaching souls. Read the book of Acts. Miracles happened all the time. But they were more prevalent when they were out working in the field. Because God said, if they're going to do my work. I want to be, I heard what he just spoke to us. I want to be where his hands are. If he's reaching past me, then I'm not in his hands. I want to be where his hands are. And Sister Savannah, I, I, I know mission field's calling you, but what we've got to learn to do is turn America into the mission field. And when we can turn America into the mission field, we'll see revival. like we just sat under the great commission maybe that's stretching but I do take somebody around you say I'm ready to go
I'm ready to go. Everybody take your vitamin and invite one man. Just invite a man between now and Sunday. Invite one man to church. Do it personally. Do it publicly. Do it social media wise. I don't care how you do it, but get somebody invited to the house of God. Let's see what God will do this Sunday. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Brother Morgan Coffee wants to meet with the young people in the prayer room real quick. We'll do that quickly because I know school is calling. It's still light outside. You're dismissed. I love you. Jesus loves you. I'm sorry that I went a little over, but uh, I love you. Jesus loves you. Brother Brandon, is that what you want me to announce? Or you want something?